Welcome back. And uh, just before we start with Tim, who's an amazing analyst of the geopolitical, historical, and military history, I was watching um, Fox News last night. Well, lately, I've been watching it since the election. Uh, Hannity and uh, O'Reilly. And, of course, there's a bit of, uh, how can I say, elitism. O'Reilly said, well, in response to one of the emails that he had, why don't I respond to conservative talk radio? And he says, I don't respond to conservative talk radio because talk radio is entertainment. It's not journalism. Who said I beg to, this is uh, O'Reilly. <laughs> now, I beg to differ. We are the down-in-the-dirt real journalists that get real information from real sources that you would never use, put it together in a way that you need. He's one of the better of the lot, by the way. O'Reilly, by the way, most of the time... He's pretty close, but many times he's pretty timid, too. He doesn't want to deal with issues like he said to the other night that uh, the issue of abortion is settled law when he had two women on. Uh, one of them was an attorney in Los Angeles, and I have to say, no, it's not settled law. Uh, in fact, the Supreme Court made it very plain that all you had to do was have a congressional statement that the, that the fetus and the embryo at the moment of conception is a separate human being that's genetically distinct, and it's the moment when life starts, and Roe versus Wade and the whole abortion issue and fetal research just goes away. So it's not settled law. So I beg to differ, and I think you need to correct your statement. We're the real news, and even though you're the best of the lot, uh, O'Reilly, you're part of the snooze to put people back to sleep. And he's one of the best of the, of the best of the regular media. The regular media, by and large, are pretty disgusting, like the so-called parade of fawning journalists that literally asked, I uh, call slowball questions to the the liar in chief, and he answered with such a dull response while smirking, and they were preening his feathers, you know, like a peacock. It was just disgusting yesterday, and I, I couldn't watch the whole uh, presentation by the abominator. But I got to tell you, you journalists that think you're sitting pretty up in the Fox News Network and elsewhere, uh, you better watch out your back because we're coming. And it's okay for you to quote us, but don't try to, to add one up and say that you're the real journalist and we're just uh, entertainment. We're not. Well, I'll tell you about the real journalist. Uh, they've been losing market share uh, at an incredible rate. And that's because, the reason that's because is, people like you I and mean, I are liars. Well, I'm a medical doctor that had classified clearance and it's been exposed to a lot of stuff most people will never see. You're a history professor and an analyst and a military consultant. We're real people that have had real jobs, seeing real things, and these people have no qualifications even to discuss or interview the issues which we talk about. So, no, the level of quality of information they're going to get from us and the questions we're going to ask, the most important thing is not that people will believe us. They keep their skepticals on, and once they check out the articles like you have posted up on your blog or we analyze and present, like I did in hour one about the idea of secession, what we really need to do, which is reform the banking structure, we present solutions that are not insane, and, and you don't want to label them left or right. They just retain the republic, restore human rights, and bring us back to a, a, a government under well, God. Well, you see, my first loyalty lies to God. Right. And my second loyalty, uh, I would say, that would lie with my wife, but she's dead. Uh, she's with God. So my second loyalty in, in that order lies with my country, which is the United States of America. Now, I may have these old Scottish titles, but, you know, uh, Major General Lord Sterling was George Washington's chief financier during the Revolutionary War and actually would take over his command when, on the rare events when Washington would take a leave and go home to Mount Vernon. Uh, and one of my best friends, he's a direct descendant of Major General the Marquis de Lafayette, who in uh, Sterling and Lafayette had houses just across the street from one another at Valley Forge. Yeah, so what and we need to do, friends. Tim, though, without getting into all history, is that you're a patriot, and we want to restore the republic. Now... I I'm want to done. save this country from these evil, and pardon the language, these evil bastards that are doing everything they can to, de to destroy the America that our ancestors set up and all of us, I mean, our future lives, our children, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, they're doing everything they can to destroy us. 
Exactly. And, no. and, and, and the central focus, the, 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 the most important tool being used against us is the Federal Reserve System. Before we had the Federal Reserve System, we didn't have World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, etc. We didn't have an income tax. We didn't need an income tax. These are, these are all banker wars, by the way. The current war right now, which is now in the economic phase of a, a trade war with China and these other countries, it's a debt war. We're literally printing 40 to $80 billion per month in mortgage-backed securities. QE3 is a debt war against every nation. It's an economic war. These wars in Syria and North Africa are a war between Saudi Arabia, which is our economic ally with the banksters, and Iran and Russia and China. And, of course, so we're in the proxy war phase and the economic phase of World War Three. It's already started. It started at 9-11. It started even before then. With the yes, fall of the Soviet uh, I Union. I agree with you, but I, on my blog, I have put up uh, uh, one of my uh, signposts, and it says Third World War Beginning. Yes, yeah, and, right and the top I believe of it, that it? The, the military phase now is beginning. Uh, right. Tel Aviv has now been hit with several missiles fired from Gaza. The war on Gaza is escalating, and the counter war on Israel is escalating by the hour. Uh, look, anybody the- with half a brain knew that uh, very soon a, a big war against Syria and Iran was coming, and that uh, Hezbollah and Hamas are allies of both Syria and Iran, and that they, they form an axis. I call them the Axis powers, and the uh, what I call the Allied powers are Israel, the globalists, uh, NATO, in particular the United States, Britain, and France, and then also the Gulf Cooperative, uh, the conservative uh, reactionary Arab monarchies. Okay, now, a, what I have said uh, for several days, and I'm one of the few people saying it, is there has been a major event that, that took place, and that is the, the Axis powers, Syria, Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas, have taken the strategic initiative, and this is very important. It was Hamas that was firing 90 and 100 and 120 missiles. Uh, now, Why? Well, they know they're going to get hit. It's a matter of days or weeks. Uh, but by drawing Israel into a battle uh, against the Arabs and, uh, and the civilian population in Gaza and, 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 and getting Israel to repeat the, uh, the cast-led operation of four years ago. Where they, where they failed, of course. Where uh, they, the, the Israelis failed because... They couldn't well, match Israelis take failed, the... but what they did is they slaughtered an incredible number of Palestinian civilians. They took out hospitals, they took out ambulances, they took out uh, schools, uh, water uh, filtration plants, power plants, etc., etc. And if they hadn't stopped, if it had went on uh, two or three more weeks, you would have seen a coup in at least one Arab country and that military going to fight uh, Israel. Now... Right. Uh, what this does, this coming general Middle East war, which is now beginning, uh, it's changed the narrative, the overall narrative of it, from a Shiite versus Shunti war in Syria to a Arab versus Arab and Persian versus Is. It, uh, it's really it, it, basically Islam against Israel. Uh, one yep. of the things that happened, and you, you probably have this on your site as well, is that the the new uh, Mohammed Morsi, the new uh, uh, president of e- Egypt, basically pulled back his ambassadors from Egypt. That means they're not going to honor the uh, treaties that they had because of the continued activity in Gaza. Uh, Egypt has got a very well, large military. Sure, you know, I'm not sure in his case he 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 can honor him. Because uh, he has a new field marshal in charge of the armed forces, which he put in. But you have to remember, these people aren't total puppets. They have a belief system, and right, you have a you now have the the Islamists have taken over in Egypt. Well, Israel that's why the Sinai surrounded itself with enemies and is provoking all of them deliberately. Yeah, in, in fact, up in the uh, Sinai Peninsula just a month ago, they had a major attack against a multinational force by Salafi Muslims in the Sinai of Egypt. So they're not going to take out Israel without uh, total annihilation is what will happen. Oh, boy. 
not going to happen. Yeah. Tim, while I was on break, I, I pulled up the judge report, and since this started, you're right, there was only, uh, there were 274 rocket attacks since this operation started. They I call the operation the uh, Pillar of Defense's second day, rocket fire bringing in uh, uh, in the southern central areas. It's the first time since 1991 when the Scud rockets are coming in from uh, Iraq. These are not little bottle rockets. They're bumping it up to the next level. And we know but they the can't do. Warheads are still dumb warheads. That is, yeah, but they, they, high explosives. They're let let me finish. So, they're not biological. Yeah, let me, let me finish, Tim. Air. Tim, let me finish. The issue is the rockets don't have these payloads yet, but they're bumping it up, which means they're moving toward the Jafar Five, which is a GPS coordinated missile that can carry a nasty payload of fuel, air bombs, biological, chemical weapons. Absolutely. Uh, and that means that this escalation means. We're moving into a phase where you say you're right. This is moving to from a Sunni and Shiite war to a war against Israel, and I think that the and re-election Israel of a weak has president already lost the strategic initiative, and this is shows the absolute raw stupidity of Netanyahu and his war cabinet. They blew it from day one. I also, I think that if Israel thinks that they're going to just kind of do an air attack against the stockpiles of VX nerve gas and so on, which they know the location inside Syria, because they know that these will be transferred as this war escalates to Hezbollah in Lebanon and along the Syrian-Israeli border and Jordania, that, that they increase the, the risks of a nuclear counterattack against uh, Damascus, I really think that as this escalates, it increases the chances that these weapon systems will go to South Lebanon up on the Golan Heights, which is already having tank attacks. I think there was over a hundred and some missiles that were fired there the other day. Now we know it's up to 274 missiles, and they're using dumb payload ones. This is going to get way out of control real fast. Yeah, Israel's called up 30,000 reservists. That's roughly three divisions, but she's already had a large number of, division, uh, of reservists on call uh, and in uh, on the Syrian border and elsewhere. So Israel is calling up all of its reserves, not all, but it's 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 working on it. Israel think, doesn't call all of them the same day because they would flood the roads, okay? You, they, have Tim, a, you, they, they have a system worked out. Tim, do you think that the uh, it's likely that because of the election of a weak, non-supportive uh, to Israel president, that this provoked uh, this to accelerate faster? I think that I, I wouldn't say provoked. I believe the timing was well thought out by the Axis side. I yeah. think they felt they had to wait till after the election was over. I think they were afraid that uh, uh, Romney would be worse than Obama. Although I, I disagree with the, the consensus that Obama is, is is a weakling, I think he's he's almost as bad as Romney in, in terms of support of Israel. Right, he leads the it. UN has already been screaming, uh, you know, Israel is, is is right and everybody else is wrong. The usual. Uh, what, what Obama likes to do is lead from behind. He he doesn't like to say we're going to charge in there at the front of this, although he's already provided the long range tankers. Uh, to look, if, Israel, if, if he was a friend of Israel, all these characters in Congress that that scream up and jump up and down how great friends of Israel they are. If they were real friends of Israel, they would be screaming and jumping up and down, telling Netanyahu, "You damn fool! You're starting a war that's going to get your people destroyed." Right, and the fact is that. Uh, what should be happening is that uh, the president, whoever this idiot is in the White House, should be calling up the Russians and Chinese and saying, look, we need to go and stabilize these weapon systems. We need to stop supporting al-Qaeda terrorists. By the well, way, the it, it, of, it's already, it, it's beyond that now. It's beyond I know, that. I know, I know. This is what should have happened. The third world war is, is burning. Uh, the third world war has begun. The military phase of the third world war is beginning and has been in the process beginning now for about 48 hours. And it's beginning in the worst place it could begin from the Israeli perspective, because the way this is playing out, uh, the Arab streets are going to go ape, because they're going to be killing more and more uh, Arab civilians in this giant concentration camp, camp we call Gaza. There's about a million-some people there, and they're mostly unarmed, 
And uh, based on what happened four years ago, it's going to be horrific, bloody, unacceptable to uh, just about anybody. And uh, it, it's, you know, you could see you could see some military coups in some Arab countries and those countries military suddenly joining Syria and Iran. And that's a very real danger. It's not the generals you have to watch out, although there may be a few. It's the captains, the majors, and the colonels. Exactly. Now, what? Uh, let's go to some of the articles you have posted up, Tim, because uh, we have all these things like the Iron Dome Fair. I was am posting uh, a lot of yeah. things. Yeah. Let's go through some of the high points here, because it's going to tie in that we have the fiscal cliff coming. We have uh, this accelerating war that's taking off. Uh, everything tells me that 2013 will be in, in the Latin an ennis horribilis, meaning a horrible year. <laughs> it's not going to be. You better enjoy Thanksgiving next week, and you better enjoy Christmas because uh, I call it the I don't nightmare know how after Christmas will be. But uh... yeah, yeah, well, it, relative to to uh, as I say, the coming conflagration, and we might even have a period that we call false peace because I think that Obama is now the number one candidate for being the false prophet, signing the peace treaty to partition the state and back off from a war where we, the Palestinians out of this conflagration will finally get their state. Because he's going this week, the head of Hamas, who was born in Zafed, which is North Israel territory right now, is going to the United Nations to actually get observer status as a nation. This conflict can only end up with a false peace because of the accelerated yeah, forward but, war. Yeah, you know, there's an internal uh, Israeli uh, government paper that says if they do this, uh, we've got to overthrow uh, the, the president of Palestine. I mean, they're that opposed to it. They'll do anything they can to, I, to, to stop them uh, going up the next ladder in terms of the U.N. And, and I, I find that the idiocy beyond... Uh, what they uh, look? This is all yeah. about land. They want more land. They want what's left of the Palestinian land. Yeah, but that's and, only a small little strip of land. Uh, I, what will happen out of this is that the Muslim nations around it now, with the Salafi Muslims and the Muslim Brotherhood taking over in Egypt and Tunisia and Libya, uh, this conflict with the expansion with backing for Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the Arab Emirates, this war between Sunni and Shiite Muslims is in the sense just a pre-war warm-up for the war with Israel. And what, what I think is like... What the, the strategic shift is it's now a war with Israel. It's not a Shiite Shuni. You notice nobody's talking about Shiite Shuni. Well, right there's, both war, there's both wars going on, though. This is the real issue. Uh, five years ago, before the uh, the meeting in New York City, where they actually had these social networking groups, which are the primary means that they could kind of communicate know, they, to they, start the... They, this is all set up in New York City, by the way, with all these with well, the, the CIA, CIA and, 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 and all the social networking companies and, and the Mossad, and they right. cooked up the so-called Arab Spring. Right, they cooked it up, by the way, to put in the place globalist proxies, which are Muslim masons called the Muslim Brotherhood, to actually control all these Islamic nations, and it's backfiring. Yeah, it's called blowback, and yes, it has, because now you have a, 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 a rapidly approaching war. Uh, in the south, and guess what? Uh, all these people in power, uh, they're serious in Egypt. They're not going to support Israel. They're not going to sit on their hands. They've no. already recalled their ambassador, and Egypt has a lot of American F-16 fighters, and they... Welcome back, and we have joining us Chris Harris, uh, but we want to mention briefly this amazing update uh, analysis and that is now linked uh, to the honeypot uh, theory uh, that Petraeus was caught in a honeypot with this one Broadwell. Tell us the theory and uh, well, who the journalists okay. were that uh, put this uh, up. First, let me give you a little bit of historic background about Slick Willie, President Bill Clinton. Uh, President Bill Clinton was uh, in office, and guess who was Prime Minister of Israel at the time? Dear old BB, as I call him, 666 Netanyahu. Right. And uh, Clinton hated him about like Obama hates him. Uh, BB has a problem with foreign leaders. He must be incredibly arrogant uh, to his compatriots. But anyway, right. uh, BB was uh, scheduled to come to the United States, and uh, it was pretty much uh, a given thing that. Uh, Clinton was going to twist him every way uh, but loose. 
and Bibi was going to head back to Israel, and his coalition was going to collapse because of uh, 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 because of what President Clinton was going to do to him. And guess what? Lo and behold, Monica Lewinsky popped up out of the woodwork, and it wasn't Bibi Netanyahu who was fighting for his political life, but Bill Clinton. Now, right. Monica Lewinsky just happened to be Jewish, and guess what? She was a Mossad operative. Uh, and, okay, now the... What's, uh, what's the current parallel? What's the, what about Broadway? Okay, what is, so you have this four-star general that was running everything in, in, in the Middle East, and he's now he's been head of the CIA, and his hot girlfriend just happens to be Jewish, and just coincidentally happens to be connected to a whole bunch of leading neocom uh, extreme Zionist uh, fronts and so forth. And, you know, he falls for her. And now, now, this is a very brilliant woman with uh, advanced degrees and everything else. And she's sending him emails and uh, she's leaving a trail, okay? And at the right moment in time, Bam, he's gone. Oh, I forgot to mention. He uh, met, he came out and said that Israel was a strategic uh, drain on the United States. And uh, he said a number of things that the neocoms and uh, Netanyahu and the Israelis didn't like. And here right. he is as we're going into this uh, general Middle East war, World War Three, And, well, he's head of the CIA. They had to take him out, and guess what? EB took him out. Yeah, yeah, it makes total sense because it wouldn't make sense. And also, this one Kelly, uh, it turns out her name is Dawam. Uh, she has a twin sister. It turns out both she did. They're that Lebanese. She, yeah, Lebanese, and she. It turns out that her sister uh, had uh, custody issues, and both General Allen and Petraeus wrote letters in support of custody battle. So th this little clique here, these women. They're literally honeypots. Actually, we're manipulating Alan, who is sending very obscene emails back and forth, and so he's on walking Alan, the plank. Alan, who's a four-star Marine general, who's a, who who has been uh, the chief guy in Afghanistan, and he's now going to uh, or ha was scheduled to go to Europe as the supreme the... commander of NATO. Right. So, in other words, These uh, are what they've done, powerful, I, I... important positions. I think your thesis, the thesis that's published here from Global Research, suggests that uh, that Netanyahu and the globalists wanted to uh, clean these people out of the way because they were blocking a, a, an attack and a backing by Israel against Iran. And they the want this war. They're Americans begging them. Admirals to, and generals have put America in ahead of the globalist agenda and the Zionist agenda and have said... We don't want to go down this road to World War III because it's going to destroy America and the world as well as the Middle East. And this is Netanyahu getting rid of several of our generals. Now, granted, the generals were absolute idiots. And I don't even think these gals are all that hot. Well, well the, yeah. the one gal's pretty hot. But, I mean, so what? And these guys yeah, are 60, uh, well, I'm yeah. 61, pushing 62. Okay, they're 30-something. Well, you know, give me a break. I mean... My mother was very straightforward in her language. She would say he was thinking with his wrong head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got it. You got it. But, I mean, these guys are, are yeah. the head of the, the, the... If you're going to be head of the CIA, you ought to know about honey traps. I mean, if you have you ever watched James Bond? I mean... Well, they put their guard down because they thought there were... They, you know, it was obvious, too, that the... the the kind of communications certainly suggests that Kelly was feeding this information, even contacted and had some kind of an affair going on with this guy sending any shirtless emails oh, to and, her. And, and by and the way, she, the FBI just coincidentally happens to dump all this information uh, on Representative Cohen, who is not on the Intelligence Committee, but is one of the most pro-Israel uh, Netanyahu supporters in Congress. Just right. coincidentally. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. And by the way, yeah, this is uh, this has all been a setup, and and it also goes into the attack in Benghazi because yeah. evidently we were using the so-called consulate there as a prison uh, where yeah. we were torturing people, and that was set up actually by the Mossad and Saudi Arabia to embarrass uh, uh, Obama on the eve of the election, and and uh, Romney didn't. Mm -hmm wasn't smart enough to use it properly. Yeah, exactly. It, it gets really Romney, complicated, Romney had taken, but it's all 
a, a spook operation. Everything's right. intelligent. And by the way, I heard from my sources that Romney even took blood oaths in Israel to back Israel's attack on Iran. And so what it meant is that uh, the Israelis were counting on, they even had rabbis for Romney uh, in Israel, they were counting on Romney getting in because they knew that, so this is basically to, call, to haul Obama, who wasn't going to support the war in Israel, haul him kicking and screaming into World War III. I'm not, I'm, well, he... Yeah, because he, he's supporting them, but he's not. The thing is, yeah, he doesn't I, give a... I, it's he's like, playing both sides. It's like he's eighty percent there, and, and twenty percent of his mind is saying, "Oh my God, don't do this! This is insane." Exactly. And, in other words, he's on both sides, and Netanyahu doesn't. There. And and that's why Netanyahu, and even in the Israeli government, there's a lot of people saying, "No, no, this is not a wise thing to do." And, and Obama's and he's saying, "Getting rid of key people." Yeah. And, yeah, and the, right. the head of the African Command, uh, this black four-star general, was just demoted to three-star general because supposedly he overspent some funds and all. And if you buy that, I get a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. Yeah, I'll make okay. A real deal. That's really interesting. Okay, we want to switch gears to Chris now. Chris, you've got some major updates on what's going on in Fukushima and also here in uh, North America. Then I want to go back to some of the news later. But what's happening in Japan with Fukushima? What's the latest? Okay, Dr. Bill, uh, we discussed a long time ago that a prudent thing to do would be get some cover, a, some, some sort of a building or a cover, a temporary building at least, over the uh, exposed spent fuel pools. And now the last one that doesn't have a cover over it, they did listen, I guess, and they, they did build them. Unit 3, which was um, really blasted badly and is destroyed and probably has fuel damage in the spent fuel pool, uh, is finally getting a a tent-like structure put over it. I guess I, I kind of called it... Uh, That's what we even talked about. We talked about a tent-like because it has to be flexible because hydrogen uh, explosions could cause a solid building made with the frame and put with various panels, blow it up, just blow it off. So you need something that has something like spider skill, uh, Kevlar, uh, and then you have to have a filtration system to filter it and then to convert the, the aerosol radioisotopes to a liquid and the liquid to a solid. Then you need to be able to okay. transport it safely to a depository area at the bottom of a tin mine uh, through yeah. special ships. So well, yeah, they're well, finally I, doing something. Also, yeah. well, Please continue. Say, well, when, I, uh, when, I, when I send you something, so I, I kind of research it, and I usually try to give you at least three different sources all talking about... Uh, you know, the same event or, or something so that uh, it's, it's well-researched. And if you do go to so one of the links that I did send you were directly from Tesco's, uh, uh, they do show exactly what you just said, a, a, um, an atmospheric cleanup system. And uh, so that's just a tall order. But, uh, they must be listening. Not. They must be listening because you said this year uh, over a year ago, and we formulate the idea that they need a corium catcher, they need an aerosol catcher system, they need a, a, a seawall to prevent this from getting to the under oceanic area and bubbling up from miles away off the oceanic coast. Uh, the problem is that this is creating buckyballs at the ocean surface that are floating across. It's creating aerosols that are going to be mobilized to the upper troposphere. Uh, and they estimated now 300 billion becquerels are being released per day into the Pacific Ocean from Fukushima. You, and, uh, you two have said this, and it's taken them a year to do what you, you, you guys said a year ago. More than a year now. Yeah. 21 months. I, I also said it was a big job, and, and it wasn't going to happen quick. But... Yeah, amazing. Chris, can come back and tell us more about uh, some of these other issues dealing with the NRC and the nuclear issue dealing with uh, uh, tectonic issues and so on. I mean, this is really, uh, we're, we're going to have a, a Fukushima-like event in America because we don't have it hardened against CMEs or extreme weather. We saw that, for example, with the Oyster Creek facility and other facilities. 26 were actually in the pathway that could be affected by this Hurricane Sandy, which only was a Category 1 hurricane. The damage was caused by them literally parking it because you know it was manipulated over the area to rain for a week. Uh, this is scary stuff because they're using weather warfare against our nation by globalist elements within our country. They're using this advanced technology. We know how they do it, too. Uh, and so tell us what's the latest in terms of, of what else you want to talk about in Fukushima and also here the NRC in North America. What are they doing? Okay, well, let me just start. Uh 
quickly uh, discuss Unit 3 over uh, at Fukushima. They are going to try to go ahead and get uh, some spent fuel out of the pool, but that's going to take a really long time. But right now they're trying to clean up that pool so it has, it has some visibility. But you've got to see what you're doing. You can't because the water's all murky and full of all kinds. They can't even get close to it, okay, they, because it's so radioactive. So everything is done robotically. Uh, with with uh, very crude cranes and things, and and you saw the result when they dropped the steel beam into uh, into the into the spent fuel pool. Well, they're trying to retrieve that pool. This is one of the reasons why they're going to have to build a tent over that particular structure anyway, so that um, they can get people closer to it in a cleaner atmosphere. But one of the things that one of the TEPCO releases that really intrigued me was that there is something called uh, curing material. Now that means to me it means that. There, they know about a tear or a rip in the spent fuel pool liner, and they're not. They're, they're, they don't come out and say. See, a lot of the stuff you have to go ahead and read between the lines on it. But there is a, um, a something called curing material. I sent you some uh, a good link on that, and what it means to me is they they they've tried to repair with some sort of a, an epoxy and something that needs to uh, that needs to cure or needs cure time. On it before they can proceed, which means that um, the the means that water is actually being held in not by the stainless steel liner but by the uh, stru- the concrete structure around. That's that's not really a great situation to be in, and uh, they didn't come flat out and say. But I'm I'm going to put my stick my neck out and say if, if they got material if they're trying to seal up cracks and everything else, that's how I would do it too. And so uh, that's that's happening now. We'll see where where that comes, and I'll I'll stay on top of it. And uh, we talked about Oyster Creek and the uh, manipulated storm over it. Well, also, um, the uh, NRC has sent out a special inspection team to uh, Oyster Creek because, um, and I sent you an, uh, a link to that one also, uh, be- because there are a lot of questions. Now, they, they, they do say that, you know, the plant was never in danger and everything else. However, we're going to have, we're going to send out a, a it's very contradictory when you say it, say it that way. I'm saying, yeah. you know, the uh, the NRC claims that there was no challenge to safety at the Oyster Creek plant during Hurricane Sandy, but those but they're sending a team out there. anyway, right? Yeah, yeah that, 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 right. This contradiction in statement and action, just a contradiction between statement and the action, is taking place because uh, um, nobody could hide the fact that flooding was greater than ever predicted there. So um, that that in itself will will have to be looked at. And they're, they're, they will look at that. So I just, um, you know, I just wanted to give you a heads up. And I won't know for at least 45 days to 60 days what the conclusions are, or you know, whether it'll be uh, whether any kind of actions will have to be taken from from this. But uh, we'll keep our eye on it for sure. That's, um, that's amazing. Oh yeah, yeah. So it was. It was. It was. I mean, we. we I, I stuck, like I said, I went back and I stuck my neck out and said, "This one. This one looks pretty smelly to me." And. Uh, you know, By the way, out. guys, I've heard a report that HARP is active over the New Madrid Fault area. I hope that's not the case. You, you can go to uh, harpstatus.com and it'll tell you the latest analysis of the HARP energy uh, uh, data. Now, uh, so what about the, uh, the the issue of rebuilding nuclear reactors over fault lines? What's going on there? You sent me another news report on that, uh, Chris. Okay, so... Uh the esteemed IAEA, who we all know, trust, and love. Oh, yeah. They're, they're wonderful yeah, people. Happy. I mean, well, the people you invite over to a barbecue, right? <laughs> well, they do have scientists there, and I guess they had to give them something to do, and they said, well, why don't we go look at uh, volcanic hazards when we're going to start building uh, any kind of a nuclear facility? It's about time, right? So they were using old guidance that was 30 years old. Now, I remember uh, January of this year, we talked about a uh, brand new seismic report that discussed uh, uh, new 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 um, uh, criteria for uh, seismic sh- building build, building nuclear power plants in, in areas that were previously thought to be quiet. And now they're not uh, seismically. Well, this kind of goes hand in hand, and I like to think of this as more evidence of Earth's changing conditions. Uh, so now this new report, which I'm not, I'm going to tell you, I'm not all the way through it. I just got it uh, last week, and I've been trying to make heads or tails of it, but it looks like they're coming out with some kind of guidance uh, about volcanic hazards. Um, 
to not only nuclear power plants, but also uh, reprocessing facilities and spent fuels uh, facilities and, and all kinds of uh, structures. And I just like to think that there's a reason why that these, these kinds of uh, documents are coming out now, uh, because there's a need for them. And uh, I, I would think that, uh, well, high-profile pro- high, high nuclear power plants are a good barometer of what's going on, because they are high-profile, and any kind of uh, other kind of structures like, um, you know, refineries and, and chemical plants, everything else should also take heed as to what, what these are saying. So uh, I sent you that report, and it has some, uh, has some good maps in it and has some good information as to what to do, but it also it has uh, a lot of guidance now that was not previously there as to, uh, and they're looking at, uh, instead of uh, recent uh, volcanoes, they, they want to go back to 10,000 years. You know, they're talking about the Holocene period. And so uh, there's, uh, there's, there's some more in-depth guidance as to where you can build these and where you can't. And it seems that uh, it's, it's high time that somebody put, put some kind of guidance out. You know, it's only been, you know, I guess, I guess better late than never. So um, well, in this case, actually, it's probably too late because there's a lot of them already built, and maybe, maybe they are uh, in areas of volcanic activity. I don't know that answer yet. But yeah, the, the number I have researched is that 75% of U.S. reactors, and there's 104, are within the strike zone of a major rea- earthquake fault line zone, where they will not only lose a uh, backup power because it will disrupt the local feeding power lines, but also make it impossible to get even diesel fuel there for their backup generators, uh, and will also break the uh, plant uh, containment system. In other words, the earthquakes are large enough that they'd expect a 7 to 7.5 plus earthquake that they'll lose containment. Um, plus, they don't even know why Fukushima had it, because most of these reactors are Mark I and Mark II designed, or they're steam generator type reactors with faulty designs like San Onofre, where they now know there's lots of things that were designed into these plants similarly, that major, there's major engineering flaws in the very basic design. Well, and, and that, that also doesn't speak too highly for the, uh, for the grid itself, because, I mean, anything vulnerable... Mm-hmm. grid's going to go. Uh, uh, I tell people i got a 20-kilowatt generator. We're going to be posting up uh, Zenith Solar out of Israel and the VC Solar next year. If you don't have backup power, you're not going to have any. And it's a good idea to have solar as well as uh, lithium pyrophosphate batteries. We'll be bringing on suppliers for those as well in the next uh, month or so. Uh, the grid's going. I mean, we're going to have a CME or we're going to have a war where the, our enemies will use EMP-type weapons against us. You're not going to have power, and you might as well get used to the fact that if you're not self-contained, able to grow food and defend yourself, you're not going to make it even a few months out, let alone living years. And, and so they, not having power will be like going back to the dark ages. And I'm not saying it's going to happen next month or next year. I'm saying we're most likely, if you look at the biblical issues, we're looking at under the Obama administration's second term, we'll most likely will have come to the brink of the cliff of disaster, not only the fiscal cliff of a World War III starting from the Middle East, but also a peace treaty that will be the covenant with death, talked about in the book of Isaiah, where they will sign a treaty, partition the state and the city, start the blood sacrifice, on Sakat or the Feast of Tabernacles, and the last seven years, the last 2,520 days, the clock shall be ticking. And every single one of those major feast days will tick it off. The Feast of Purim is next at 1,230. 1,260 days is the Pascha or Passover. The five months where death will flee from them will follow, and the 2,520th day is the Feast of the Long Blowing uh, or Yaram Teruah which means basically the Feast of Trumpets, the vinyl trump. If they think that's not coming, you're not paying attention. Things are moving along very quickly, and we have the false prophet now as a re-elected president. Hard to believe. My soul and my guts are in in a knot right now. But you better get down on your knees and on your face and pray to the Most High God to save America. But it needs to transform people first, to repent in people. And don't be fooled by prosperity either. Thank you, Chris and Tim. Back tomorrow with Firing Line.